Coming up, the Brooklyn Nets organization and fan base needs to practice patience in the rebuild process. But then again, maybe not. We break down the quick turnaround for the Nets all coming up next. Wrong button. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ah, yes, my friends, it is the Locked On Nets podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. He's Doug Norrie. I'm Adam Marbick. We thank you, as always, for making us your first listen of the day. We are 100% free on all those great platforms. And let you know today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code Locked On NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms, they do apply, just like Doug. Terms apply to the rebuilding process and whether it takes days, minutes, seconds for the fan base to start to maybe think about getting this thing done a little bit quicker. I think the Brooklyn Nets can get this rebuild done before game one of the upcoming season. Do you concur? <laughs> Might be on slightly different timelines, but in general, it does seem like, you know, the you know, you know, when you head into a rebuild, it can always be tough because, and the Nets fans have not experienced this before this, like this exact sort of like um, path that they're taking now. And there can be some moments of trepidation around staring around the rest of the league and saying, well, look at the examples of the teams that did this poorly. The Pistons are still doing it. The jazz kind of are still right. doing it. The Charlotte's it's still doing it. Right. And these rebuilds turn into half decade slash decade long, you know, practices and all of a sudden years and years slip by and you're still rebuilding and still going for bad, uh, you know, those bad draft picks or the good draft picks with bad records. It does appear like the Nets are positioned to not have it be that exact way if their chips fall correctly here. And Brian, Lu uh, Brian Lewis, the New York Post has reported that they're the sort of the, the tenor around coming from other people associated with just sort of the deals that the Nets would have made think that they probably see this as getting right back into the free agent game in 2025 on the back of a good draft pick, a couple of good draft picks and a bunch of cap space. And I do think right. that that's like moderately realistic and the Nets have some other geographic advantages that the other teams that I mentioned before do not have. And I yeah. think that probably all adds up to if things work out even just okay here for a year, the Nets could be looking at just kind of being back into relevancy relatively quick, even though that's probably not on the likely side, there mm -hmm. are ways that this could end up working where the nets are not mired in a 10 year long d devastation of, of losing game after game and us trying to like talk ourselves into why that's the best thing. And I think because remember they got back also the 2026 control from Houston. So on the one hand, you could sit here and say, well, the next two years and the draft and that rebuild process is that's important for us. We don't want to spike out of it by getting a mid-level star or, you know, one of those lower tier stars that we've talked about in the past where one player isn't going to make it. However, I think next year's draft is what makes it so interesting. When you have four first round picks in a very deep draft class, do I think it's likely the Nets make every one of those picks? Maybe or maybe not. Combine a couple, move up the board and target some guys. But there is a realistic world where the Nets draft three players in the deep draft class. And when you look back, we could say they got one of the top guys. Okay, that's what you wanted. Top three prospect. Great. But we also got a guy in the 15 to 20 range and then a guy in the 20 to 30 range. And in most years, you might talk about them being closer to lottery players than they are mid to late round first picks in a deep draft class like this. So it's hard to my, my hesitation on that quick of a rebuild 2025 right back in the mix would be the difference of getting these young players and then confirming that they are ready to be those core pieces for you over the course of next season. Once you do that. Then you go to the market with all your with all of your cap space and the ability to track somebody and say, look, we have the core here for you. We just want to drop a superstar into the mix here and have you lead them. That might be the one variation here. But when you have four picks like they do in next year's draft class, that's why I think you can look at it and say, yeah, we can do whatever we want here. And that can include many things, trading one of these young picks, trading one of these young players next off season, just knowing that you're going to have limitless, seemingly cap flexibility when it goes into that offseason. 
Yeah, I think it's aggressive also. Like, I don't necessarily take that as like, that's why I was like careful, careful to, you know, sort of pinpoint the idea. It's like, it's not likely. It's not likely that right. something kind of can do it. it. This can happen, but will it? it? You know, yeah. if, if they had like this treasure trove of young ass, young players right now, I might see it differently. They have a couple of guys that I think are like interesting in Cam, Th- Cam Th- it, it would be better than interesting um, in Cam Thomas and probably Noah Clowney. It's not like this. It's been this. It's like this complete youth movement right now. They have a couple guys who are real NBA guys. And after that, you know, once Cam Johnson's gone, once Dorian Finney Smith's gone, once Ben Simmons is gone, like after that, they don't have much. And that's the thing where it's like, okay, you do have to squint to see it to think about 2025. Now, again, if a bunch of these guys come up open in the cap space and that's just able to overpay for them and you're able to really Mm -hmm. look at, hey, we got Cooper flag. We got ace Bailey. Like we got one of these guys. Um, and, and everyone's like sort of on board that these guys are like the ne- next group of superstars plus the picks going forward. You probably can sell guys on an idea. It's probably just cutting it a little too close. And then that's probably the right. only thing. The good news is I think if you're a Nets fan, and, you know, as opposed to some of these other fan, these other, um, fan bases or these other teams that I mentioned before that have admired in irrelevancy slash sort of, um, you know, sadness. And aptitude. Yeah, totally. It's the Nets have kind of every built in advantage already. Plus flexibility. The fact that they have yeah. the, the, just, just starting here, the fact that they're in New York and I know people are going to like, well, the Knicks sucked forever. I agree. It doesn't guarantee you, you know, get a uh, success to just be in New York. It just, but we can agree it helps, right? Like yeah. it doesn't hurt you. <laughs> it's not a detriment to attracting a player. Yeah, just yeah. dropping your team in New York doesn't mean you're going to go for championships clearly, but it definitely gives you an advantage over the Utahs and the Charlottes of the world when it just comes to attracting free agents. So point stop right there. They have it. They're going to have the cast piece because they're going to have all the bad money off the books starting, you know, at the end of this year, no, no, almost mm-hmm. no matter what. And then they're going to have this just treasure trove of draft picks, which even if they didn't want to use them, could be used to package guys into other stuff, used to package for other real players. So they the, the the reason the Nets fans, I think, should look at this and feel really good about it is unlike other teams that are headed to the tank right now, they have way more flexibility than a lot of these other teams. Like, I'll give you an example. Go over and look at Chicago. Chicago is probably going to yeah. want to be bad. And you're like, okay, well, they're going to go and they're maybe going to try to be bad. They got Levine on like one of the worst contracts in, in basketball going out many years now. They don't have the kind of right. flexibility that even, you know, they have the other building advantages. Chicago's a good market, you know, good historical fan base, whatever, all this stuff. But they just got a terrible money. And so like the Nets just don't have, are no longer, ha- are no longer burdened with some of these other problems. No, it's a hundred percent. There are few instances when you have the best of, at least on paper, all worlds, financial flexibility, draft flexibility, and also the the opportunity of time and not having. Well, can I say one thing? Sorry, done right now. Go ahead. Go ahead. Real quick, the Please. one thing they don't have, the one thing they don't have, is the one best of all is they don't actually have the superstar. The best of all worlds is have already the guy and <laughs> okay. then have all that other sure. stuff. Like I so sorry yes. to cut you off, but I just wanted to throw it in there that that's the best thing. The best thing is hey, we already have fill in superstar and all this flexibility. That's the best situation you can be in. The next best and thing is to have is to be able to go a couple of different directions. And that's why coming up here in a second, if the Brooklyn Nets land that superstar in next year's draft class, what would the path forward look like as some names potentially come onto the market? We talk about the active decisions that Joe Shane, Joe Shane, Brian Dable, I've been watching Hard Knocks, baby. Oh, baby. That, that Sean Marks <laughs> will need to make for the Brooklyn Nets and maybe the New York football giants. Who knows for sure? We'll get into it in just one moment here. <laughs> All right. Before we get into that, we'll tell you about our friends over at Game Time. Look, when it comes to buying tickets, whether you're going to an MLB game this summer, whether you're going to a concert, a comedy show, a play, whatever it's going to be, you want to make sure you're getting in on the best tickets. You want to make sure you're, the ticket buying experience is going to be easy, the best deal. See exactly what you're going to see when you sit down. That's all what you're going to get over at Game Time. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace for Major League Baseball. It makes tickets, getting tickets faster and easier than anywhere else. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets the first pitch over at game time maybe you're interested in you know going over to your to a yankees game yankees um excuse me reds at yankees july 4th 
got deals available there starting from you're not going to believe this starting from five dollars five dollars on july 4th starting there over at game time i actually had to do almost did a spit take there i couldn't believe it when i actually read the price (laughs) just a little bit of a window into what you're going to get when you sign into the game time app take the guesswork out of buying mlb tickets with game time download the game time app today create an account use the code locked on nba $20 $20 off that first purchase. Terms apply. Create an account. Uh, the uh, the Game Time app. Redeem the code Locked on NBA for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. All right. So as we continue today's Locked on Nets episode, not talking about go. another team, though. It's all You're locked relative, in. Doug. They, 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 yeah, they, listen, nobody, <laughs> nobody's more dialed in than yours truly. Next year, if the Nets choose to draft a running back high, I think that would be a mistake, right? Positional value. No. The, the thing that I find interesting as we talk about a quick rebuild potentially for the Brooklyn Nets and having all these assets and picks, and then you mentioned not having the star. Well, let's say that Flag or Bailey ends up being the star. The one thing that I find fascinating when I say active choices for Sean Marks and the Brooklyn Nets is if you go get that player and then you add some other pieces too, you do end up in that world with all the cap space and flexibility. We often use Giannis as the example because Milwaukee seems to be heading towards some interesting territory. If, if all of a sudden Giannis becomes available, I'm not saying you don't jump at the opportunity. But at what point do you take the step back and say, okay, what's the risk reward here of going all in on a superstar again with a lot of our assets, maybe with some of these young players? I fast forward it another year into the 2026 offseason, where I think at that point, if you're the Brooklyn Nets, you look at the landscape and you say, okay, what stars are available? What moves can we make here? We're still going to have a ton of cap flexibility. And then we've also identified not only the value of these players from a draft perspective for our roster, we've also allowed them to showcase themselves as valuable to other teams potentially. While I personally fall in love with a young talent and want the young core, it it, it only behooves the Nets to be patient around developing some of these young talents out of a deep draft class so other teams can get excited about what it would mean to give up a superstar and make those type of trades. Yeah, look, I I think we're we're going, we're piggybacking off a report, some of the reporting here. So like, I I agree that 2025 feels probably a bit too soon. And it's more just a, it is more just a window into like that, this might not be a forever kind of thing. I think if we're being realistic about it, it's like 2025, 2026, like you said, we control that pick. Don't rush it really here because your best assets now are your ability to sort of control within a window, like high end draft picks, right? Like that is right now, that's easily their best asset is these, is these picks where they can be bad. And with the draft class that might go f- at least five deep around like potential superstars and the Nets, if you know, just got to lose some games and guarantee yourself into that window with the ability to spike maybe generational talent and you're, and you're looking pretty good because like things, the way things are shaking out for this 25 draft, which we're already starting to follow very closely is that like, oh, there's like five guys here that are probably real guys. And like one of them, like VJ Edge, yeah. like he's playing in uh in the olympic tune-up and he looks freaking awesome and he's like projected to go five (laughs) and so um which he might climb a little bit but regardless i think if we're being realistic like yeah 2026 and on is is probably going to be the thing because i think what we're seeing here especially with the way this offseason is shaken out for the in the nba is that you know these teams are are terrified of the second apron clearly like that's not even like they are absolutely i mean team guys teams just letting guys go that they should never let go. Like KCP yeah. is out of Denver with disaster. Paul George is out of, they said it was the second apron. I think there's probably other stuff. Like he's out of LA. These teams are just, are terrified of like the, of what can happen to them if they get into there. Unless you're Boston, Sweet. you're paying everybody. And then also saying you want yeah, to, but they won the championship. The That's the, they won the championship. No, it was why, why the Denver things is, is, is I, I can understand LA, but like the Denver thing is so terrible because it's like, Hey, they have a great starting five. They have a championship level starting right. five. You can't just like start letting these guys go to pinch pennies. It's, it's, it's makes no sense. It's like, this is not the point. Anyway, what we're seeing is if we understand that this is like this second apron is essentially a hard cap, the next best thing you can do to build long-term sustainable a uh, product for yourself is to just get guys on rookie deals. I, like that's it. It's like, yeah. you know, you yeah. mentioned, I know you got NFL on the brain, but you know, we've talked many, we talked often about the best thing in the NFL, right? Is get these rookie, these quarterbacks on rookie deals. Cause you can then build out, you can essentially overpay around the rest of the yeah. market to make sure that you're a really high end team. Being able to reset around rookie deals around really good players is going to be a superpower for the Nets going forward. And you actually probably don't want to sacrifice your ability to do that like sooner rather than later. 
No, a hundred percent. And I think that's why when we look about, oh, so I wanted to ask this question because the short term turning around 2025 and being like, Hey, we're, we're back, baby, bringing the superstar ready to go. We both agree that that's too soon. Do you think though, because I, th- as this has started to unfold, we've both cautioned fan bases about the fan base about at, listen, you know, this could be multiple years of really bad teams, a lot of losing, but in the long term, it should pay off for the Brooklyn Nets. I I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic to say that you can go through this upcoming season, get to the 25 draft, have all those picks, go through another season with young talent developing, still probably lose a bunch of games, and then get to that next draft. Once you get through the 2026 draft, I don't think it's unreasonable as we highlight teams like the Detroit Pistons who keep getting in the lottery and keep not being able to get over the hump of winning basketball games. But I don't think it's unreasonable to look at it in the in the OKC model of, hey, if the core is right, You'll win some games. You're still still be on the lower end of it, but we could go into that next season or that off season or the potential of superstars and say two years into the rebuild, we can actually flip this thing over and be back in the mix. That that to me feels like the splitting the difference here between ultra aggressive. We'll be back in it next season, and then the other version of it. It's 2030 before you really see success for this franchise. I I, I feel comfortable saying that's like a realistic path is the 2026 following that draft class following the next two seasons there can be an opportunity for Brooklyn to be back in the playoff fringe play in tournament territory with those discussions and maybe adding a player or a star of some kind yeah i mean it requires one of your guys turning into sga basically like not like yes. that exact yeah. guy like you, you know yeah. the, re, that's why i want to go back to the beginning it's like you still have to get the first guy like you have to have one of your guys be SGA. You need one of your guys to be Luca. Like you need, like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not taking these names lightly. Like you need to have your, you need to hit a pick and these don't off. This doesn't always happen. Like you have to have these guys like Tatum, all the guy, all the teams that are in, in the mix here for the, for the most part are teams that hit on the draft pick and the guy became a top 10 player, right? Like that's what you, that's the real thing. And that's not easy. Now we're cycling out some of the older guard here, and LeBron and guys like this are, are getting are aging out and PG and Kawhi, like these guys are getting old and two or three years from now, they're not going to be around. Right. So we're going to cycle that group out, having the guy that can be into that next group and which is already starting to fill up, right? Like SGA and like these dudes are the like Tatum's already there. Luca's going to be there for a while. Jokic is going to be there for years like that. That group's already got dudes in it, but mm. to, to really evaluate, you actually can't do the next evaluation until you're confident the first thing went right. And sometimes right, the guy's right. lamella ball, the, sometimes the guy's lamella ball and you're like, ah, maybe not, <laughs> you know, sometimes right. the guy's like Cade and you're like, maybe we'll see it's, it, it could, is it organization? Is it him? It's hard to tell. Like sometimes those right. dudes, it, it, you know, and then it's like James Wiseman. It's like, okay, well, nope missed you know like there's <laughs> there's uh there's it's so it's 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 not clear it's not clear so yeah. um and that is like where you have to just pause and just wait a little bit and say do the dude do the right thing now lose some games guarantee yourself in the top five try to get number one pick you know try to get like the bet the worst odds overall or best odds overall it would be in the worst team and then in a year or two, know if you have you actually have the guy. Like have, because if you don't have the confirmed. guy, you can't you can't do it. You just it, but th- this is the risk. Like this is the risk. Like those guys, yeah. it's it's rare to have them, but this is all, also the best way to get them. Yeah, have confirmed that you did hit on those couple of key players that you need in order for this to be successful. Coming up here in a second, there's more to add into the asset pool that the Brooklyn Nets have to pull from. Looking just at the Kevin Durant trade and the Cam Johnson of it all and what that'll mean for the Brooklyn Nets going forward, plus a question about the 2025 draft and which way Doug and I would go with those four picks looming. we get to that in just one moment. All right, so closing out today's Locked on Nets episode. First and foremost, uh, I, I'll, I'll give the shout out here to uh, Billy Reinhart. He had thrown up yesterday about how, hey, man, this is a heck of a draft haul. And someone had posted nine first round picks for Kevin Durant. Said, hey, don't forget, already converted one of those Phoenix picks into Noah Clowney. Make it 10. Go, well, OK, hold on. As I quietly whispered, Cam Johnson, once he gets moved here, when you talk about the totality of that package for Kevin Durant, you know, remember, remember the Rudy Gobert and saying, my God, that was a haul. But this is going to this has to be right. The biggest draft total draft compensation when it's all said and done 
that we've seen in, I mean, if not ever, when was the last one that was bigger than this package? And arguably that's worked out at least on paper more favorably than it feels like it's going to right now for the Brooklyn Nets with how things unfolded with Phoenix. And then obviously the ability to recoup their own picks there as well from Houston. I mean, it's the best they could have done, probably. Uh, like, they just, it just couldn't work out better. And I'll tell you right now, I know people want to hate on Mikhail for all the stuff, like, um, you know, just, you know, maybe seeming a little checked out and, and whatever happened this year. The, the biggest part of the reason why this is going to end up, well, besides Durant, the second biggest reason that this is going to end up turning into a massive haul is because Mikhail increased his value. Like yeah, he, yeah. I know, I know people, I know people hate it because they, they see it as a down season and they don't like the fact that, he stayed friends with those guys easily. The next, the, the best, best thing that happened was that he played awesome at the end of the year last year, two years ago, like when he first came yeah. over and then played, you know, sort of miscast, but also thankfully stayed on the text chain with all of his boys because that <laughs> getting in, get because getting in that next level is the reason why yeah. it is. So hate on McHale all you want. They got a huge haul from him, which never, like, it would have been Durant for McHale straight up with like a pick yeah. if it if it had been yeah. this would have been the case coming out of phoenix right like th yeah. they the fact that they got him in that deal and then swapped him out for five more picks or whatever then like that is that is such that's good that's actually underrated at this point so that yeah so yeah that's so what like when, it, when it comes when it comes out the fact that he was able to play out of his mind for that first bit and remain likable and stay friends with the villanova guys and just be like an overall good player on a great contract Yes, mm -hmm. like this is going to be huge. We'll see where the Cam Johnson thing lands. They'll get something for him that will yeah. add in. But yeah, in terms of the overall thing, the overall just assets in return, forget where they land. Forget where right. they land. Just being process based rather than results based, at least for right now. Oh my God. You'll never, they'll, no one will ever get a trade like this ever again for a player. Like it's just, there's, yeah. I, I can't imagine because if you value the young player, you know, I guess like the one difference would be, the one I would say is probably in that realm to go back to this team is that OKC PG one because same kind of thing. Shea turned into way better than anyone thought they were he was going to be right, right. Like when because he turned out so great on the back end of it that that one is going to look probably in the same realm because Shea became a top five player or whatever. But right. Right, you know, so yeah, like, like yeah, the, the, the value sending out that player at the time was oh, young, young, you'll you'll end up with young talent, OKC, but not to this level. Once you spike that, then you feel like you've actually won out on the back end of that trade when you're giving up a player like PG at the time. Yeah, yeah. So I think like that one probably you know without thinking too hard about it, like I think that one probably still ranks higher just because you actually did get the guy, like, and that's yeah. where <laughs> that's but but just just assets like player in assets back. I mean, these teams won't do this anymore. They really won't because the, se the second apron, it's too risky to trade these picks. Like, they just can't yeah, do it. Like, well, the teams are just not going to do it. It's just way too risky now. And by the way, like, the in-house thing you can take a look at, and this is just first-round picks in general. Well, you spike on Noah Clowney, but the Nets also made another first-round pick that year. It was Dariq Whitehead, and that's TBD not looking terribly optimistic, although I, I want to think he can get healthy and be a contributor. That's not just about the Kevin Durant package, but relating back to the nature of, yeah, having all the assets is great. But some of them have to hit. If one, when they don't hit, when it looks like it's going to be an okay player, an average player, that's fine. When you draft later in the first round, you end up maybe feeling like you you spiked on a player like Noah Clowney. That only enhances what you got back in return in all of these trades. The last thing that I was curious about here is looking forward in the, as we fast track this thing. But next year, you can go by any other outlet you want. I'll go by Tankathon. Why? Because they put the Nets in the number one spot in the draft next year yeah. and get Cooper Flag. Right. Fantastic. And we can debate about you know who who you end up wanting at that point. But then they have the Bucks pick coming in at 24th overall, the Knicks pick coming in at 25th overall, and then 28th via OKC coming in as well. If you're sitting there going into the draft next year and you have in this deep draft class <laughs> overall number one, but you have this top pick and then three picks in the 20s, would you would you rather combine those in a deep draft cap like this to go identify one other player? Maybe, you know, hey, there's a guy at 12 and back into the lottery. You really want to go get him or in the vein of, hey, man, the more shots you take, the more chances you have to hit. Mm -hmm. Would you just take it as it falls and say, we'll take four swings in a deep draft class and hope that two of them end up hitting? Know that the one at the top has to hit and we'll take three shots at another player hitting at a high level because philosophically. 
I'm a little torn about that idea of combining all your assets into one more player and then looking back and going, well, if he misses, maybe we get Cooper flag, but we kind of wanted to have our one and our one a coming out of this draft class potentially. Okay. So I, what I don't think they'd be able to do is like move up. Like, I don't think they'd ever be able to move up from like three to one, let's say using those picks. Cause no one's no, going to trade. No, out no, no, of, yeah, no yeah, one's yeah, ever yeah. going to trade out of the flag. Like, yeah. From back like, end of the I, first, like to mid first or something. Yeah. 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 So I don't think, cause I had, we had that posited by someone and I was like, I just don't think that'll ever be realistic. Like there's nothing you could pay depending on how it shakes no. out. Like we're a year, we're a year away from this. So it's like, it's hard to know. These things do change. They change over the course of a year. You just don't know what's going to happen. I don't think they, but on be paper, to, these guys are all too talented for teams to say, oh yeah, I'll back out of the number one or even the second, whatever it is. You identify the guy you want. Teams are probably going to look and say, yeah, we like him. We love him. And look, you know, there was the Luca year where I was like, hey, Sacramento, don't draft me because I won't play. Like, there's always things that can happen that you just like don't know. And that's how you get, uh, you know, Marvin Bagley going going ahead of him or whatever. And then so, um, or Aiton. Guess that what? That you Aiton? still draft Luca and then you deal with it later. That was the Trey Young. It would sure seem right. like it. And I just, I, I don't know where we are with situations like that. Regardless, I, I, the Nets, are, and we're seeing it now because if you actually look at the roster for this team, like they like, have nobody. And if they trade guys for expirings, like Cam Johnson yeah. or Dorian Finney Smith for like expiring money or whatever. Like they're the roster could be hilariously thin. It's just you know, they made no free agent signings really. And at that point, drafting just as many guys as possible because you there is a path to playing time. Because somebody's gonna look at that too. It's like, is there a path to playing time for these guys where they can actually right. all get on the court and develop? Like that's become problems for some teams where there just aren't enough minutes. Right. It's like Houston's got all these young guys. It's like, well, it's kind of hard to find the minutes, right? Like OKC was like this for a while. It's like we got all these young guys. They just they can't all play. Right. And so um and the concern around maybe not realizing the talent because you can't get them on the court enough to yeah. have them develop, right? Like, I mean, there's, or just there's lose them mentally there. or just like everyone gets yeah. pissed off because they don't have a chance. Like, I don't know. There are there are problems uh, that can rise. I, I think right now we look again a year out. I'm I'm always gonna be the Marks has always seemed to draft well draft as much as possible you know like draft yeah. as much as possible and and develop and see where it goes and i know a lot of the you know the internal this front office has moved around a lot over these years a lot of them have been frankly hired as promotionals <laughs> like promotional hires right like they're just they they did so well at brooklyn that they went off to have better jobs other places like peterson and charlotte yeah. and stuff um and so it's not always the same team but considering they've always done this pretty well i'm gonna be the look we took decades off drafting, really. Just use all the draft picks. <laughs> like, yeah. like yeah. when you take 20 years off a of draft out of drafting, pretty much, um, or 10 years out of drafting, pretty much. Like just, just go ahead and just pick all the picks. I, I just, we don't need to consolidate them at this point. They just they got some they got some ground to make up for the things they haven't done over those last couple of years. Yeah, that would that would be my stance too. And I just find it fascinating. And obviously the Cam Johnson of it all, the Dorian Finney Smith of it all. I, I keep reminding everybody, keep replenishing in the background more picks down the road. Doesn't have to be 25, 27, 28, 29. The more that you keep yourself replenished in future years is the way that you offer yourself flexibility as you work your way th through this rebuilding process. So or again, by, or, reason or, or real quick, right like and I've interrupted you a few times today, buddy. I apologize. You can I know it's been off. upsetting, but I you can give me all, you guys, I look, I'm excited. I'm excited. I got a lot of things to talk about here. <laughs> I'm an um, excitable guy. Yeah, I'm excitable. Is that you also do things like, because it, it's risk-free to do stuff, stuff at this point, but it's like, you know, you go to the Lakers and you say, look, I'll take a pick, but I'll take Jalen Hood, Chafino too. Maybe that it wasn't going to work out for yeah, you there. Yeah. He's got, maybe yep. maybe he's not even going to be good, right? I don't know, but you draft him in the first round for a reason and there's no path for playing time. Like taking flyers on these guys like this, now too these young guys who had no path for playing time um i think is also a reasonable thing even if the guy doesn't look great because you're like you know you didn't get that long of a look at him especially sorry that is a really good point in the short term this upcoming season before they have the four picks in 2025 that's the version of moving out these last couple of veterans and saying we'll also just take a young guy that we can throw into our mix and see if one of them bubbles up as well and can be a guy that we want to keep going forward. So find, yeah, more young talent, more more opportunities to build up a core potentially or build up a player that you can trade down the line. All positive for the Brooklyn Nets, who are a team destined to win seven games next year. But I don't want to interrupt you again. Are you good? I, I, feel, bad. <laughs> um, I feel bad. I think I'm all, I think I'm all set. If you want to say a couple more things, um, you can. Like I, I, owe you, I probably owe you here.
Um, you know what? You do this whole next episode solo so you can get all your thoughts out. You know what it was? Um, I, just a couple of thoughts on the Giants, if I could, before we go. <laughs> oh, you know what? Never mind. We're even. I should. It's good that I interrupted you because who knows uh, when during a comment. Who knows where I would have gone? You would have just, you know, been talking about Malik Neighbors <laughs> or something like that. And now we're totally off the rails and now you're having to apologize. So never mind. I, I take it back. I don't apologize. Okay. We are going to get out of here. Go. Make sure you subscribe to Locked on Nets. We've seen an incredible boost in uh, subscriptions oh, yeah. over there on Locked on Nets on YouTube. I mean, we. You know, we we're hovering around 7,000 forever, and now we're just climbing toward 8,000. So if you want to be part of the group, then make sure that you know when we're going live, when we're doing all this other stuff on Locked On Nets, make sure you subscribe to Locked On Nets on YouTube. Wise to resolve and patient to perform. That's Homer, maybe Simpson. I don't know. There's only one Homer. Okay. Like when it comes down to it, there's only one Homer, and that Homer is Homer Simpson. And I don't want to hear from all you history <laughs> that is nerds. All you all you history nerds can just can just beat it. It's Homer Simpson. Uh we'll be back. <laughs> one of the all-time great poets. We'll be back again tomorrow talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball. Basketball, 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 basketball. Yeah.